morning, everyone. Happy Palm Sunday. We're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 21 this morning as we celebrate Jesus' entry into Jerusalem as a king and as a Messiah, a day that was prophesied to the exact day uh, by the um, prophecy of Daniel, and Jesus fulfills it because he is qualified to be the Messiah. That's what we're going to talk about this morning. Jesus is qualified to be the Messiah. A Messiah that was promised to Adam and Eve in Genesis. Uh, they weren't told much. They were told that someone would be born who would fix the sin problem. They had plunged the world into sin and God promised them that he would fix it by someone being born. That was all the prophecy that people had for a long, long time. In fact, 1,500 years after Adam and Eve, we see Noah, and he still has the same prophecy. And 500 years after Noah, we see Abraham, and he gets some additional prophecy. Uh, and Abraham, and Isaac, and Jacob, and Judah all get additional prophecy about the Messiah, uh, about um, the Messiah coming from the line of Judah, that he would be a king. And we start learning more and more about who the Messiah would be. The nation of Israel goes into uh, captivity in Egypt, into slavery, and Moses is there to take them out. And we see Moses and Joshua and the time of the judges, um, and they are worshiping God, and they are anticipating a coming Messiah all through that time. And they are getting more and more information about who God is and what his character is. Uh, we go into a time of the kingdom of Saul and David, Solomon. We see a divided kingdom, a northern kingdom, and a southern kingdom. Um, during the life of David, we get additional promises about who the Messiah would be and what he's going to look like, um, that he's going to be uh, someone who would sit on David's throne forever. Both nations go into captivity. Uh, Jeremiah is there to, to witness the southern kingdom going into captivity, and he's given information about a new covenant, a covenant that we're going to um, see Jesus talk about in the upper room as he um, is giving Passover to his disciples. Uh, he mentions the new covenant that is in his blood. That's what we talk about when we take communion, um, and that's what Jesus is talking about on the Passover and that is the new covenant uh, that Jeremiah is talking about, a covenant with Israel, but a covenant that allows us to spend an eternity in heaven. We see a return with Ezra, Nehemiah, and Zerubbabel, um, and all of this time there are prophets who are giving us additional information about the Messiah, and eventually we see Jesus. 4,000 years or so after Adam and Eve got that promise, Jesus, the man who's going to fix the problem, comes on the scene. We know much more about him. Uh, we know that he wasn't just merely a man, but rather he was a man and God uh, combined um, without um, ruining either his 100% godness or his 100% manness. And he enters Jerusalem on the exact day that it was prophesied, uh, the exact day that Daniel had said that he would, would enter. He enters Jerusalem and shows that he is qualified to be the Messiah.
chapter 21 verse 1 says as they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage on the Mount of Olives Jesus sent two disciples saying to them go to the village ahead of you and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her untie them and bring them to me if anyone says anything to you tell them the Lord needs them and he will send them right away we see that Jesus is the Messiah because his prophecy is true think about the events that are happening here Jesus is approaching Jerusalem. He sends his two di disciples ahead and says, in this city, there's going to be a donkey and a colt. All right, that's a good prophecy. It's not too bad, but it's much like me saying, go into Spring Grove and there's going to be a car there. And maybe I'm a little more specific and I say, it's going to be a truck. It's going to be a four-door truck. Well, of course we'd be able to find a four-door truck somewhere in Spring Grove. Of course the disciples were going to be able to find a donkey somewhere in Jerusalem uh, or in the, the town of Bethpage. But where it really gets me is he tells the disciples, steal it, uh, untie them and bring them to me. Now, of course, it's not uh, stealing. God, uh, Jesus created the, the donkey. It is ultimately his. Uh, all of our possessions are ultimately his. Uh, and should be used for his glory, and that's what this colt and this donkey were being used for. But then the next phrase, if anyone says anything to you, well, I have a four-door truck parked in Spring Grove, and if someone came up and took it, I would say something to them. So there's just this uh, underestimating uh, how, how people are going to react that really shows the prophecy uh, is, is something quite unique. If anyone says anything to you, tell them the Lord needs them and he will send them right away. That is not how most of us would react if our stuff was being taken. Uh, the Lord here um, is probably more like a master type, type thing uh, than necessarily being the, the Lord of all creation. Um, if anyone says anything to you, and of course they will, then just tell them the Lord needs it and they'll send them right away. For the most part, that is not how people react, and yet that is exactly how these people react. We see in Mark 11, this is exactly what happens. The disciples go, they see the colt, they see the donkey, they untie them, they start bringing them back to Jesus, and someone questions them, and they say the Lord needs them, and they're let, um, they're, uh, let go. They are sent on their, their way to bring this colt and this donkey to Jesus. Jesus is the Messiah, not only because his prophecy is true, but because he fulfills prophecy, he fulfills scripture. Verse four of Matthew 21 says, this took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. This is the prophet Zechariah. Say to daughter Zion, see your king comes to you, riding gentle and riding on a donkey, and on a colt, the fowl of a donkey. He fulfills scripture. Jesus is the Messiah because he fulfills scripture. There are a number of promises uh, in the Bible, a number of prophecies that Jesus had to fulfill. He had to be born in Bethlehem. He had to be called a Nazarene. He had to be born of a virgin. It was prophesied that he would die and be raised from the dead, which he did. He had to be born in Bethlehem, be called a Nazarene, but also be from Egypt, all of which he did. He had to be called the son of David. It was prophesied that he would be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. It was prophesied that there would be a forerunner to his ministry, which there was, John the Baptist. All of this shows that Jesus fulfills scripture. The book of Matthew is written to Jewish people as its original audience, and that's the reason that there is a uh, genealogy at the beginning of Matthew 
to show that Jesus has the lineage to be the Messiah. It was very important to the Israelite people that Jesus fulfills the qualifications for being the Messiah. And that's why a number of times in Matthew, you see that he says this was done to fulfill what was spoken through Scripture. This is Matthew's way of saying that Jesus is the Messiah. And one of the reasons, one of the evidences that he is the Messiah is that he fulfills Scripture. Matthew 21, verse 6, the disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Jesus is the Messiah because he is able to accept worship. His prophecy is true. What he says is true. What is said about him is true. He fulfills the prophecies in the Old Testament, but he is able to accept worship as well. So look at what is happening. The disciples did what they were told. They went and they got the donkey, and now they're riding into Jerusalem, and they place their cloaks on the donkey for Jesus to sit on, and a large crowd, not just a large crowd, but a very large crowd, spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut down branches, cut down um, what we um, think about when, when we're in church on Palm Sunday. We usually wave our palm branches around. Those represent the branches that the uh, very large crowd cut down and spread on the road. But look at what they say. The crowd that went ahead of him and those that followed. So Jesus is in a middle of in the middle of a very large crowd. People in front of him, people behind him, walking along the road, and they sing Hosanna to the Son of David. They say Hosanna, which is the word save, um, the Son of David, a messianic idea. We talked about David, King David, and that there would be someone reigning on his throne, that the Messiah would be a king like David. This is their recognition of that, that he is the son of David. They continue, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. In Luke, uh, Luke phrases it just a little bit different. He said, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. So there is a recognition that Jesus is king, that part of being the Messiah is being king. Now we understand that they did not have all the information that, that we do, just like Adam and Eve didn't have all the information that Abraham had. The people in Matthew 21 did not have all the information that we had. They didn't understand that Jesus was not about to set up a kingdom that weekend, but rather um, was going to do something that uh, was unexpected to them. They say, Hosanna in the highest heaven, a recognition that this is some sort of God type thing that this is not just a man walking in to do what he wants to do, but rather this is the son of David, this is the king who's walking in to do what God wants him to do, that this is an appointment by God, that this is something divine going on. Uh, in John chapter 12, we're told uh, that they also say, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Again, a recognition, a recognition of something heavenly going on here on earth. And then they also say, blessed is the king of Israel. So Matthew says, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Luke says, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. And John says, blessed is the king of, of Israel. There's a recognition from the people that Jesus is something special. And then in Mark, we're told that they say, blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. The coming kingdom, something future of our father David, but looks like something in the past. And blessed is that kingdom and it absolutely is blessed but they certainly didn't understand exactly what they were were saying so here they are able to uh, their they worship and jesus is able to accept that worship we see throughout scripture that god is the only one who is allowed to accept worship when king herod accepts worship uh, he is eaten by worms and dies when John, in, at the end of Revelation, goes to bow down to an angel to give him worship, the angel says, by no means, don't, don't do that. Um, only God is, is worthy of worship. So as a qualification for being the Messiah, for being God, for being the Savior of the world, Jesus must be able to accept worship. And here is a large crowd in front of him and behind him giving him worship.
Earlier in the book of Matthew, the Magi arrive in Jerusalem about 30 years before this. <clears throat> and the reason that they came is a prophecy in Daniel that told them the exact time that the Messiah would enter Jerusalem. It wasn't a prophecy of his birth, but it was a prophecy of Palm Sunday, the triumphant entry. It was a prophecy of what we celebrate today. And when they entered, Matthew tells us that the whole city was stirred. And I've used the illustration before that it reminds me of the caravan in Aladdin, where they're singing and dancing, and um, Aladdin's driving on a, riding on a big elephant, and there are dancers in front of him, and 75 golden monkeys, and this uh, whole, whole thing. And the whole city comes out to see what's going on. And I envision that being the way the Magi entered Jerusalem. Jesus enters um, not on a large elephant, but rather on a donkey, and he, but he does enter with all this praise and worship that he deserves. But when he entered Jerusalem, Matthew 21 verse 10 tells us that when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, who is this? One of the ways that we see that Jesus is the Messiah is that he stirs whole cities. Um, that his mere entrance into the city caused a stir, caused a commotion. Who is this that a very large crowd would go out to see him, that a very large crowd would gather, that a very large crowd would worship? Who is this? He stirs whole cities. In fact, in John 12, the Pharisees say, look, the whole world has gone after him. Um, as um, thousands, hundreds of thousands of people in Jerusalem um, would have been stirred by Jesus coming in, the Pharisees describe it as the whole world has gone after him. And people ask, who is this? And the answer is interesting. After being told that um, the crowds were proclaiming that he was the son of David, that something heavenly was going on, that he um, is a king, here they say, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Uh, it shows that the worshipers did not have a full understanding of who Jesus is. While he is certainly a prophet, and he certainly was from Nazareth in Galilee, he is so much more than that. You, could, you would hope for a better response from someone else, from one of us, if someone said, who is Jesus? Um, you could say he is your Lord and your God. You could say that he is the savior of the world. If you simply said that he is a prophet from Israel, it would be a disappointing answer. So they don't quite understand um, who Jesus is and how much uh, he means to the world. And they don't understand what's going to happen in the next week. But they do understand that something special, uh, that there is something special in Jesus, that the whole city is stirred. Let's move from Matthew to Luke chapter 19 to see um, a parallel account of the triumphal entry. Um, and in this case, Matthew 19, verse 41, says, As Jesus approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it, and said, If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. Another way that I believe um, Jesus is demonstrated as the Messiah is he is stirred by whole cities. Before he stirred whole cities, now he is stirred by the city. He looks at Jerusalem. He looks, um, sure, Jerusalem is the, the center of government and promise and messianic promises for Jesus. But I think he is mourning the people in Jerusalem. That if they had only known on this day, would bring them peace. And that peace is Jesus. That he was coming there to die on a cross. He was coming there to be raised from the dead. He was coming there to fix their sin problem and bring reconciliation and peace to their relationship with God. If only they had known, but now it's hidden from their eyes. And he wept. As the Messiah, uh, he um, is God, and he is concerned about each and every person, every single person who has ever lived. Uh, I think this is best demonstrated on Good Friday, as Jesus is dying for the sins of the whole world, there is a man talking to him, a criminal on the cross. And as that criminal is talking, Jesus could have said, you know what, 
I don't have time for this. I don't have the energy for this. I am dealing with the sins of the whole world. I don't have time for your individual sins. But instead he talks to the thief on the cross and the thief on the cross ends up putting his faith in Jesus. So even as Jesus is dying for the sins of the whole world, he is concerned about that one individual dying next to him. And as he walks into Jerusalem, he is concerned about each and every individual in Jerusalem. And verse 43 tells us, the day will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another. Jesus is telling about a future time to the people in Luke 19, a future time when the enemies will destroy the city of Jerusalem. And notice the reason why. It says, because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. It is not because the people who did this are mean, though they are. It's not because the people who did this are sinful and evil, though they are. But the reason that this is happening is because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. And Jesus weeps. He is stirred by the city. He is moved in his emotions to know that he, the Prince of Peace, is there to bring peace and reconciliation with God, and he knows that the people are going to reject it, and he knows the consequence of that, not only an earthly consequence of the destruction of Jerusalem, but an eternal consequence of spending an eternity in hell, an eternity without their Savior Jesus, and he weeps. sealed by heavy stone, Messiah still and all alone. And then, on the third, at break of dawn, the Son of Heaven rose again. O oh, trample death, where is your sting? The angels roar for Christ the King. We thank you, God, that we have been given the gift of faith, that we have received the peace and reconciliation that Jesus so desperately wanted to bring to the people of Jerusalem and Israel and to the whole entire world. We thank you that that gift of faith allowed us to recognize the time of God's coming to us, allowed us to recognize Jesus as our Savior. And we look forward to a time in the future when we will spend all eternity with you. And we look forward to Jesus' return. And he shall return in robes of white. The blazing sun shall pierce the night, and I will rise among the saints, my gaze transfixed on Jesus' face. Jesus, we love you. Hosanna, Hosanna.